plain sailing, straight line. Then, an impact, a reef. Nine guys fight for their survival. Basically, we hit something. They're wrong! Oh, wrong! I don't know if I was knocked unconscious. I don't know whether something happened. And then within a 10 seconds or so, there was all this crashing and grinding and stuff. At that point, I knew the shit was really hitting the fan. Seriously bad impacts were happening. This is the Sailing World on Water for May 29, 2020. At 7.10pm local time on November 29th, 2014, Team Vestas Wind slammed into a coral reef, part of an archipelago named St Brandon, 268 miles up the coast of Mauritius. This week, we have Chris Nicholson and he tells the story. One of New Zealand's most famous yachts, Steinlager 2, 30 years on, Vittorio and Pietro have the latest on the Great Leap of Luna Rossa. From Team Azura we have the video of how the full 52 Super Series yachts were transported back from South Africa to their fleet in Valencia. And we finish with part two of the CYC's Evening with Grand Simmer. He talks about the 36th America's Cup INEOS Team UK Challenge. Now, over to Nico. Welcome to Off Watch, our weekly interview series. This week, I got a chance to sit down with Chris Nicholson, somebody who's been there at every twist and turn in the last six editions of the race. So <laughs> the thing that I think we, we end up touching on next is probably the St. Brandon Reef. And, you know, being on board with, uh, you know, Team Vestas Wind and running aground. And there's, there's a lot that I think um, is really fascinating about that story not least the strains that it must have put on you in terms of being skipper at that moment. Um, before we talk about what you did after the moment, what happens here? You know, we've got um, Team Vestas win, sailing along, sailing well, leg two, at night. Take it from there. <laughs> well, um, you know, like we, well, we'd gone through, gone through, quite a big storm the previous day night um so it was quite a leftover sea but the main thing was that um you know we we, we knew about some sea mounts that that were you know a fair way off a day and a half two days out we we knew these sea mounts were, were there um the mistake that was made was that we didn't zoom in on the depths of the sea mounts enough to know that they were more than just seamounts, you know. The information that that we had was that it was still forty meters of depth. Obviously, it wasn't. It was about you know three meters above sea level. So, um, but even even at that even even a depth you know differential you know of twelve hundred meters you know from the deep to the shallow is concerning. And and, and I was obviously still quite concerned about you know, wave state currents, everything around there. So we we were preparing for that. So obviously as as we were approaching the seamount, which um, you know, we everybody kind of knew that there could you know, there would be maybe like you'll see some difference in sea state potentially in this area. Um, and then literally, you know, we didn't know it at the time, we accelerated down a wave as such which would be a breaking wave on the edge of the reef and and hit um so then so you know one thing you find out later on if you're going to ground a boat a canting keel is a good boat to ground on because it literally because the keel's out to the side the boat spins around albeit violently but it doesn't it doesn't impact like a fixed keel mm. and just instantly stops so we so a lot of the inertia was taken around in a, in a sweeping corner, which sheared off both rudders. Uh, I, think, I think maybe one or both actually got torn out of the boat as well as um, broken. Um, and literally, you know, we're there fixed, like yeah. instantly, you know, 
not high and dry, were fixed in in the in the breaking waves. Water coming into the hull. Yeah, yeah, straight away. And what? Not not, not huge amounts at at that stage. Um, you know, there'd probably be two reasons for that. Is one that the keel, to a certain extent, is stopping you going deeper down. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, like we hadn't sustained huge damage, like um, to the underbody of the boat, but that was happening pretty, pretty fast. Then over the next six hours, I guess. The achievement to win all six leagues uh, was quite outstanding because uh, of the tough competition and to be able to do that, notably against Fisher and Pike in New Zealand, especially in the famous leg coming from Fremantle into Auckland. I mean, they were just two heavyweights going at each other, even before they got to Cape Reanga and North Cape and then down the uh, northern coast. It was an absolutely incredible race. Uh, so for them to um, win every league was a very, very special achievement. Mike Quilter was down below, ready to do a cross to go on uh, radio, News Talk ZB, and he heard a talkback caller say, uh, well, they might uh, have the wind they've got at the moment, but they better get ready for a southwesterly. Here in Titarangi in the Waitakere Ranges, it's changed and coming. Mike Quilter told that to Peter Blake. They looked out and could see the dark clouds coming. By then, Fisher and Paykel was at least even, if not, slightly in front and they moved in front and then the squall hit and it was like going into a tunnel you couldn't see anything the rain hit your face and it was just amazing but uh, Blake had called for a uh, an early drop and so they were able to get their sails down and manage the squall in contrast Fisher and Paykel were turned inside out and in huge difficulty and that was the turning point Yeah, well, obviously it's a, it's a special boat because I think winning, you know, we didn't really think of it so much at the time, but I think winning every leg was um, always, it will always be something very special and, and, and obviously hard to do again. But, um, and we never sort of went into the race thinking we could, you know, try and do that. It was all about how we just win the race. So that's the, that, was the, that was the whole thing. So to win each leg, we sort of took each leg like very much as a separate race. And then as we got going, and we had our moments when you know I thought that was going to all tumble down, and you know out of you know, Fort Lauderdale, and thinking we were going to lose this rig, and that was going to be the end of it. So we had um, we had some some tense times, but um, managed to hold it all together. I've climbed one Everest. Yeah, there's a few more around that need to be looked. At, so um, I'm not just going to sort of um, disappear. You know, in the background somewhere, I've got a few other things I intend to do. He knew then that he wouldn't do another wet boat race because there would be no point. I mean, he'd run every leg. It's almost like a, I oh, don't have to do that again. But yeah, let's think of the next adventure. Without Steinlager II winning on 22 May 1990 out of Southampton, all of the great things New Zealand sailing have done since, notably the America's Cups, but the Jules Verne and other things would not have happened without Steinlager II. Well, the New Zealand Sailing Trust has restored both Steinlager II and Lion New Zealand, Sir Peter Blake's 
uh, around the world race yachts and now they are used for uh, young people to go out and experience the teamwork and uh, the leadership that's needed to sail these large yachts uh, to build self-confidence and self-reliance through the sport of sailing and especially to experience the marine environment that we have here and to learn how to look after it. Well last year we had over 1200 young New Zealanders uh, benefit from our programs on board these vessels through the New Zealand Sailing Trust and we were shaping up for an even larger year this year in 2020 but of course with the COVID-19 disruption that's changed everything and we've uh, had to just park these boats up here uh, down in the viaduct and uh, as an organisation just to hibernate to try and survive so that uh, when we're able to resume our programs we can, we can continue to operate. Somehow Steinlager 2 has struck a chord uh, like no other boat. Steinlager 2 became the inspiration to people, keep on going and follow your dreams, and then the perfection, the outstanding sporting achievement also. And then the third thing of course is the knock-on effect that without Steinlager 2, all of the great things including the America's Cup wouldn't have happened. Luna Rossa take off uh, video. Finally, we got our hands on uh, the real story of uh, the take off. What, why Luna Rossa decided to point uh, to the moon <laughs> <laughs> at some point? We, we, we didn't figure out, we figured out uh, uh, an explanation of this. But uh, Philip Presti, from his uh, privileged point of view, point of view exactly. He said that it was slightly different. So. Exactly. He, he told about a consequence of a, of a jibe. Actually, mm -hmm. the jibe was uh, made uh, quite earlier, like uh, 10, 20 seconds earlier at least. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, already well ended. But uh, actually, uh, because of the jibe, the, uh, the boat was, uh, had a little accident, so had a little splashdown of the bow um, in the water. So had to rise up again with the two arms uh, in the water. Then they probably tried to uh, put up the, the windward arm and uh, doing this probably uh, they went down to the water. So they had to uh, take off, uh, okay. take off from the water, probably As thinking about what Presti said, uh, probably in the power zone, so for sure difficult uh, point of uh, maneuvering yes the power zone uh, field prestige is about uh, 120 degrees uh, uh, to the, the, the true wind true wind exactly, exactly. so where the where uh, the boat is uh, really powerful and is really difficult to control uh, so for sure taking off in this uh, zone is uh, dangerous. more dangerous and more difficult than doing it uh, in, a, in another zone uh, but they tried to, to do it uh, as well so at the end they tried to uh, go down uh, a little bit but at the end uh, probably the, uh, the radar ventilated started to ventilate when they were trying to go downwind uh, and uh, at the end uh, to bear away. So, yes. while bearing away the, the, the air basically was sat uh, was sat in the in the profile of, uh, exactly, of the radar so. and then uh, and then it ventilated and then the the stern went uh, down, splashed down. Exactly, so at the end uh, the stern splashed down and uh, we saw the moon pointing of the bow, of the moon, <laughs> of the red moon, the Luna Rosa. Um, exactly. So as, as we said, uh, the boat found uh, itself uh, with, a, with the arm too angled to the, compared to the water obviously, and then uh, raised up. So when you lose completely the uh, the radar, then it happens that you have a uh, too big angle no? of attack. Exactly, so, too big angle of attack. So you, are, uh, you, you need to point high and then uh, you need to go down again, uh, for sure. There is no, no way to avoid it. Exactly, no other way out, for sure. So uh, the heading, the heading was part of the, of the maneuver as uh, it happened uh, for uh, Team New Zealand. So the heading is part of the maneuver, while uh, during uh, this uh, takeoff, uh, Luna Rossa is already 
uh, healed uh, approximately zero no, at some point yeah. and then healed again while uh, going down in the water, while splashing in the water. Exactly. In respect to what uh, Emirates Team New Zealand did, for sure they were uh, more ready to the maneuvers, uh, mm -hmm. mostly to the jib. So okay. when the boat was going up, they were already probably in the, in the sheet. And, uh, and so at the end they didn't capsize, but uh, honestly they were quite close to capsize, no? Yes, uh, it was a uh, little, wi little wind at the point, uh, was uh, no, no more than uh, uh, medium, I would say light medium wind anyway, something yeah. like this. Uh, also the, the jib, you see the jib is, uh, is a big one, no? It can be the exactly. number one or the number two, but uh, no, no smaller than this for sure. So, so I mean, uh, this, uh, all this maneuver is uh, quite uh, slow, no? It, yeah. it happens uh, uh, quite slowly. So, but uh, they, they show they have a routine for this kind of uh, situations that is working. Also because Luna Rossa, when uh, splashes down, uh, with its uh, V-shaped hull, then tends uh, to, to heal uh, yes. quite a lot. Exactly. And so the risk of capsizing was... Uh, quite high. Exactly. <laughs> but uh, they were able to recover well, so good, good job for, uh, for the crew of, the, of the Luna Rossa. But uh, in general it wasn't uh, a, a moment of... Uh, incredible sailing, I mean, it's, uh, it's a quite, uh, let's say, slow movement uh, and uh, not too high speed uh, and uh, that's why probably uh, we didn't see the official video from uh, Luna Rossa, but just this uh, shot, which was uh, awesome. Exactly, L really beautiful, probably the only beautiful part of that, uh, of the of that maneuver. <laughs> exactly. Okay, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Bye. A very warm welcome to everyone. I know we've got a lot of people tuning in, so um, in these troubled times, a, a very warm welcome to you all. Grant, tell us about these new boats, these AC seventy fives. I mean, they're, they're, we've never seen them before. They, you know, the video clips we've seen and the, the still photos, they look absolute weapons. I mean, give us an idea of speed and, and, and what's it like. I mean, you've obviously sailed on the first boat, but just give us yeah. an overview. <laughs> They're pretty edgy, actually. They're pretty edgy. Um, very impressive uphill, uh, upwind, because there's a lot of riding moment. When you've got your full canted all the way out, there's a lot of riding moment. Um, so you're in the region of 32 knots upwind, 32, 33 knots upwind. Um, so pretty, pretty impressive uphill. Downwind, the foils are quite small, 
So you're limited to the cavitation speed of your foils. Um, so I don't think we'll see many boats doing more than 50 knots downwind. So the, you know, the, the um, SAR GP boats, the AC50s from the last cup with the new generation of foils can go over 50 knots downwind. It'll be hard to push these boats over, over 50 knots just because of the cavitation speed of the foils. But downwind we're in the region of, you know, mid 40s and upwind um, 32 or so, yeah. 31. So serious speed. But let's just talk about the hulls of these boats. I mean, obviously you want to get the hull out of the water as quick as you can and, and foil. So um, the hulls look all different, very different between all the syndicates. Where, where does the shape of the hull come into play? I mean, obviously you're not going to be down speed and sitting off your foils, but once you're up on your foils, what part does the hull play? Uh, does that make sense? I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah. you've got to house yeah, the crew and along, hold the mast. But like the boat behind me there, it was designed where we, we only had a three months to design it and... Um, we didn't really know what time of the day we were looking at the wind speeds in Auckland, thinking like a one o'clock start. So that boat was designed to actually sail okay in displacement mode. Um, but then if you look at the Kiwi boat and the Italian boat with a pretty substantial bustle, they weren't really designed to sail in a displacement mode. And the start time in New Zealand now is four o'clock in the afternoon. So in New Zealand, you either get a sea breeze, um, which is stronger in the afternoons, either southwest or northeast, can come in over the Gulf or, or over the city. And, um, and so basically, those boats are designed for a touchdown, but never really to sail in displacement mode. So, um, but both the New York Yacht Club boat and our boat are designed to sail okay in displacement mode. So w when would you envisage displacement mode? I mean, in up to what wind strength or down to oh, what wind strength? Under, at masthead, under about eight knots. It's okay. pretty unlikely with a four o'clock start. So I think reading between the lines, it would be fair to say that probably the second boat from a lot of syndicates will be significantly different in hull shape to the number one boat, the first boat. They might be, Pete. Right, okay, right, we'll move on. Okay. Now let's, let's, let's talk about the foils. The, the, the foils themselves are a common foil. Every boat's got the same. Is that that's correct, isn't it? The foil arm. The foil arm the foil itself. Arm, yes. The canting foil arm yep. is, is common. And we're making a Persico in northern Italy, and um, those foil arms um, are the same. You can change the trailing edge, but the rest of them are, are you know, structure and the shape and the leading edge is, is basically fixed. And you don't, there's not a heavy weather one and a light weather one, it's just one. Size no, but the T, the wing that goes on the end of the foil arm, like if you look um, at the end of the, the T part, yes. is can vary. And so that is, we're all developing those. Okay. And they have to fit in a box which is in the class rule. And so the foil only cans. And those T's are wings with a flap on it. So we're adjusting the flap to vary the lift as we go through the speed range. So each boat will be different there. You can design your own and... Yeah, yeah, it the way yeah. You're... They've got to fit in the rule box, but they're yep. different. And the rudders? And the rudders, there's... Um, yeah, you, there's some limits on the span of the rudder and a little bit of a limitation on what your elevator looks like. But the, um, the elevators on these boats are primarily just providing trim and the, most of the vertical force is coming from the foil. Mm -hmm. Now, sails, all soft sails? Yeah, yeah. It's a sore point with me because 
Um, last cup, you know, we had wings. Last two cups, yeah. we had the wings, which allow you a lot of control of the shape. These boats, like a catamaran, like and particularly a falling catamaran, you need a lot of camber to get going, a lot of force to get going. But once you do get going, you need to lower the centre of effort very effectively in the in the mainsail or in the sail plan. So um, the wing allowed us to do that very well and almost had, well, we had negative twist a lot of the time mm, in yeah. the top of the wings. And we really could camber up the bottom of the wings. But these, um, this class has a D-shaped mast, you know, a, literally a D-shaped mast, and then two membranes off the back of the D. And the idea is that you can camber up the leeward side and flatten the windward side. So you vary the amount of camber. Mm -hmm. uh, and you also have a mechanism in the top so you can twist, force the twist into the top of the mainsail. 